Over the past few days, the United States government has made two significant announcements that could alter the trajectory of the ongoing conflict between Russia and Ukraine. The first announcement granted Ukraine permission to deploy long-range missiles targeting Russian territory. The second, announced today, permits Ukraine to use anti-personnel mines, marking a notable shift in U.S. policy. These decisions come as Donald Trump prepares to take office in the White House within the next two months. It appears that the current U.S. administration, led by President Joe Biden, is implementing these changes to establish irreversible shifts in U.S. policy. This move could complicate Trump's stated intention to broker a ceasefire between Russia and Ukraine, potentially making such negotiations more challenging to achieve. Although the missile provided by the U.S. to Ukraine is among the most advanced in the American arsenal, reports indicate that Russia successfully intercepted it using its anti-missile systems, particularly the S-400. This escalation, coupled with deeper U.S. involvement in the conflict, could have far-reaching consequences not only for Russia and Ukraine, but also for the global political and economic landscape. In this video, we delve into these recent developments, examining the advanced American missile deployed by Ukraine, the effectiveness of Russia's anti-missile systems, and the details of the interception. As always, we begin by exploring the situation through a historical and geopolitical lens to provide context and a deeper understanding of its significance. Let's dive in. Since the conclusion of World War II, the relationship between the United States and Russia has been characterized by a complex interplay of rivalry, competition, and occasional cooperation. This dynamic has evolved through several distinct phases, each marked by significant geopolitical events and policy shifts. Following World War II, the United States and the Soviet Union emerged as superpowers with opposing ideologies, capitalism and democracy versus communism and authoritarianism. This ideological divide led to a prolonged period of geopolitical tension known as the Cold War. In 1947, the United States adopted the Truman Doctrine, a pivotal element of its containment policy aimed at curbing the spread of communism and Soviet influence worldwide. This doctrine emerged in response to geopolitical challenges in Greece and Turkey, where communist movements threatened to destabilize the region. The Truman Doctrine was articulated by President Harry S. Truman in a speech to Congress on March 12, 1947. He asserted that it was the policy of the United States to support free peoples resisting subjugation by armed minorities or external pressures. This marked a significant shift in U.S. foreign policy from isolationism to active engagement in global affairs. The doctrine's immediate application involved substantial financial aid to Greece and Turkey, Greece was embroiled in a civil war between the government and communist insurgents, while Turkey faced Soviet pressure over territorial disputes and control of the Dardanelles. The U.S. provided $400 million in economic and military assistance to bolster these nations against communist expansion. Beyond Greece and Turkey, the Truman Doctrine laid the groundwork for broader U.S. strategies during the Cold War. It led to the implementation of the Marshall Plan in 1948, which provided economic aid to rebuild Western European economies, thereby reducing the appeal of communism in war-torn regions. The containment policy also influenced the formation of military alliances, such as the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, or NATO, in 1949, uniting Western nations in a collective defense against potential Soviet aggression. This strategic framework guided U.S. foreign policy throughout the Cold War, shaping interventions in conflicts like the Korean War and the Vietnam War, where the U.S. sought to prevent the spread of communism in Asia. During the Cold War, the United States and the Soviet Union engaged in a multifaceted struggle for global dominance, characterized by a nuclear arms race and numerous proxy wars. The nuclear arms race was a central element of the Cold War, with both superpowers striving to outpace each other in developing and stockpiling nuclear weapons. The United States' use of atomic bombs in 1945 marked the beginning of this competition. By 1949, the Soviet Union had successfully tested its own atomic bomb, intensifying the race. Subsequent developments included the creation of hydrogen bombs and intercontinental ballistic missiles, capable of delivering nuclear warheads across continents. This escalation led to the doctrine of mutually assured destruction, wherein both nations possessed the capability to annihilate each other, thereby deterring direct conflict. 
To avoid direct military confrontation, the U.S. and the USSR engaged in proxy wars, supporting opposing factions and regional conflicts that served as arenas for their ideological rivalry. The Korean War from 1950 to 1953, following World War II, Korea was divided along the 38th parallel into Soviet-backed North Korea and U.S.-supported South Korea. In 1950, North Korean forces invaded the South, prompting a United Nations coalition led by the U.S. to intervene in support of South Korea. The Soviet Union and China provided assistance to North Korea. The war ended in an armistice in 1953, with Korea remaining divided. The Vietnam War from 1955 to 1975. Vietnam was similarly divided into the Communist North, supported by the Soviet Union and China, and the anti-communist South, backed by the United States. The conflict escalated as the U.S. increased its military involvement to prevent the spread of communism in Southeast Asia. Despite significant investment of resources and personnel, the U.S. withdrew in 1973, and by 1975, North Vietnam had unified the country under communist control. These proxy wars were manifestations of the broader ideological struggle between capitalism and communism with both superpowers seeking to expand their influence without engaging in direct warfare. The combination of the nuclear arms race and proxy conflicts defined the geopolitical landscape of the Cold War era. In October 1962, the Cuban Missile Crisis brought the world perilously close to nuclear war. The crisis began when U.S. reconnaissance flights revealed Soviet ballistic missile installations in Cuba just 90 miles from Florida. These missiles, capable of delivering nuclear warheads to much of the United States, were perceived as a direct threat to national security. President John F. Kennedy convened the Executive Committee of the National Security Council to deliberate on the U.S. response. After intense discussions, Kennedy opted for a naval quarantine to prevent further Soviet shipments of military equipment to Cuba. He announced this action in a televised address on October 22, 1962, warning that any missile launched from Cuba would be met with a full retaliatory response upon the Soviet Union. The ensuing days were marked by high-stakes diplomacy and military readiness. Soviet Premier Nikita Khrushchev initially insisted that the missiles were defensive but tensions escalated when a U.S. U-2 spy plane was shot down over Cuba, killing the pilot. Despite this, back-channel communications facilitated a resolution. The U.S. agreed not to invade Cuba and secretly consented to remove its Jupiter missiles from Turkey, while the Soviet Union agreed to dismantle its Cuban missile installations. Let's take a quick pause. If you've enjoyed the video so far, could we ask a small favor? Hitting the like button helps us reach a broader audience, and sharing your thoughts or feedback in the comments makes an even bigger impact. Thank you for watching. Now, let's dive back in. The 1970s marked a significant thaw in Cold War tensions between the United States and the Soviet Union, a period known as détente. This era was characterized by efforts to reduce the risk of nuclear conflict and to establish more stable and cooperative international relations. A cornerstone of détente was the Strategic Arms Limitation Talks, which aimed to curtail the arms race between the superpowers. SALT-1, initiated in 1969, culminated in 1972 with two key agreements. The Anti-Ballistic Missile Treaty limited each country to two ABM sites, later reduced to one, effectively constraining the development of missile defense systems that could undermine the deterrent effect of mutual assured destruction. The Interim Agreement on Strategic Offensive Arms froze the number of intercontinental ballistic missiles and submarine-launched ballistic missiles at existing levels, halting further expansion of these arsenals. SALT II negotiations began in 1972, aiming for more comprehensive limitations on strategic offensive weapons. An agreement was reached in 1979, setting limits on various categories of nuclear delivery systems. However, the U.S. Senate did not ratify SALT II, primarily due to geopolitical developments, Another milestone of détente was the Helsinki Accords, signed in 1975 by 35 nations, including the U.S. and the Soviet Union. The Accords addressed a range of issues, from security and economic cooperation to human rights, and were seen as a significant step toward reducing East-West tensions. The period of détente effectively ended with the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan in December 1979, 
the invasion was widely condemned and led to a sharp deterioration in U.S.-Soviet relations. In response, the United States imposed economic sanctions, boycotted the 1980 Moscow Olympics, and increased support for Afghan resistance forces. This marked a return to heightened tensions and the resumption of the arms race in the early 1980s. The dissolution of the Soviet Union in 1991 ushered in a new era for U.S.-Russia relations, characterized by both cooperation and emerging tensions. In the early 1990s, the United States extended significant economic aid to Russia to facilitate its transition from a centrally planned economy to a market-oriented system. This assistance aimed to stabilize Russia's economy and promote democratic reforms. Additionally, both nations collaborated on arms reduction through treaties such as the Strategic Arms Reduction Treaty, or START-1, signed in 1991, which mandated substantial cuts in nuclear arsenals. START-2, signed in 1993, sought further reductions but faced ratification challenges and was eventually superseded by later agreements. The eastward expansion of NATO during the late 1990s, including the inclusion of former Warsaw Pact countries, was perceived by Russia as a security threat. Despite assurances from Western leaders, Russia viewed this move as encroaching on its sphere of influence, leading to increased tensions between Moscow and Washington. Following the September 11, 2001 terrorist attacks, Russia expressed solidarity with the United States and supported its efforts in Afghanistan. This period marked a notable collaboration against terrorism, with Russia providing intelligence and logistical support for U.S. operations. However, disagreements soon emerged. The U.S.-led invasion of Iraq in 2003, which Russia opposed, strained relations. Further tensions arose over U.S. plans to deploy missile defense systems in Eastern Europe, which Russia viewed as a direct threat to its strategic security. In 2008, Russia's military intervention in Georgia, particularly in the regions of South Ossetia and Abkhazia, led to a significant deterioration in relations. The United States condemned Russia's actions, viewing them as a violation of Georgia's sovereignty and territorial integrity. These events reflect the complex and evolving nature of U.S.-Russia relations during the post-Soviet era, encompassing periods of cooperation interspersed with significant geopolitical disagreements. The period from 2014 to 2024 was characterized by significant changes in U.S.-Russia relations, primarily shaped by geopolitical developments in Ukraine and allegations of Russian interference in U.S. domestic affairs. The annexation of Crimea in 2014 marked a turning point. Following a regional referendum, Russia integrated Crimea into its territory, a move that drew widespread international criticism. The United States, along with its allies, viewed this action as a violation of Ukraine's sovereignty and territorial integrity. In response, they imposed economic sanctions targeting key sectors of the Russian economy, including finance, energy, and defense, as a means to pressure Russia and reinforce the importance of adhering to international norms. Simultaneously, the conflict in eastern Ukraine escalated. Reports indicated Russian support for separatist movements, prompting the United States to extend military aid to Ukraine. Initially, this assistance included non-lethal supplies, but later expanded to lethal weaponry aimed at bolstering Ukraine's defense capabilities. Between 2016 and 2020, relations between the two nations grew increasingly strained, particularly due to allegations of Russian interference in the 2016 U.S. presidential election. Accusations centered on cyber activities and misinformation campaigns intended to influence the electoral process. These claims led to additional sanctions and the expulsion of Russian diplomats, further deteriorating bilateral relations. Cybersecurity concerns also intensified during this period, with accusations of Russian involvement in cyber attacks targeting critical infrastructure and government institutions, adding another layer of tension. In the early 2020s, despite persistent disagreements, there were attempts to engage diplomatically. Notably, the renewal of the New START Treaty in 2021 underscored a shared interest in arms control, even amid a backdrop of broader contention. However, significant disagreements persisted, particularly regarding the ongoing situation in Ukraine, NATO's eastward expansion, and continued cybersecurity issues. This complex interplay of cooperation and conflict defined the trajectory of U.S.-Russia relations during this decade. Now, let's talk about the U.S. and Russia confrontation in Ukraine battleground. 
What are the U.S. missiles in Ukraine? The United States has recently authorized Ukraine to use U.S.-supplied long-range missiles, specifically the Army Tactical Missile System, or ATACMS. The ATACMS, developed by Lockheed Martin, is a highly advanced surface-to-surface -surface missile system designed for precision strikes at extended ranges. With a range of approximately 190 miles or 300 kilometers, it enables Ukraine to target critical Russian military infrastructure, supply lines and command centers deep within Russian territory. The missile's capability to carry various warheads, including unitary and cluster munitions, adds to its strategic versatility. It can be launched from platforms like the M270 Multiple Launch Rocket System, or MLRS, and the M142 High Mobility Artillery Rocket System, known as HIMARS, providing flexibility in deployment. The effectiveness of the ATACMS in Ukraine's hands will depend on several factors, including the training required to operate the system, the availability of missiles for sustained operations, and the integration into Ukraine's existing military framework. Additionally, the presence of Russian air defense systems like the S-400 may pose challenges to successful strikes, requiring strategic approaches to overcome potential interceptions. This development represents a pivotal moment in the conflict, offering Ukraine enhanced capabilities while introducing new complexities to the geopolitical and operational landscape. Russia's Anti-Missile Capabilities The S-400 Triumph, known by NATO as the SA-21 Growler, is a mobile surface-to-air missile system developed by Russia's Almaz Central Design Bureau. Introduced in 2007, it represents a significant advancement in Russia's air defense capabilities, succeeding the S-300 series. The S-400 is designed to engage a wide array of aerial threats, including aircraft, unmanned aerial vehicles, cruise missiles, and ballistic missiles. It boasts a maximum range of 400 kilometers and can target threats at altitudes up to 30 kilometers. The system is capable of tracking 100 airborne targets and engaging six of them simultaneously. The S-400 system employs multiple missile types to address various threats. The 9M96, a short-range missile with a range of 40 kilometers. The 9M96E2, a medium-range missile reaching up to 150 kilometers. The 48N6, a long-range missile capable of engaging targets up to 250 kilometers away. And the 40N6, an extended-range missile with a reach of 400 kilometers designed to target distant and high-speed threats. The S-400 integrates advanced radar systems for target detection and tracking, including the 91N6E Big Bird Acquisition Radar and the 92N6E Gravestone Engagement Radar. These radars enable the system to detect stealth aircraft and low-flying targets effectively. The S-400 can be deployed within five minutes, providing rapid response to emerging threats. Russia turning down U.S. missiles, the Ukrainian armed forces launched a targeted strike on the Bryansk region using six ATACMS ballistic missiles, according to a statement from the Russian Defense Ministry on Tuesday. The attack reportedly occurred at 3.25 a.m. local time, which is 0.25 GMT, and involved U.S. manufactured ATACMS tactical missiles. Russian air defense systems intercepted five of the missiles while one missile was damaged mid-flight. Debris from the damaged missile landed within the technical area of a military facility, sparking a fire that was quickly extinguished. The Russian Defense Ministry confirmed that no casualties or significant structural damage resulted from the incident. The interception operation utilized advanced defense systems, including the S-400 air defense system and the Pantsir missile system, highlighting Russia's ability to respond to such threats effectively. Conclusion the U.S. decision to allow Ukraine to use long-range missiles for strikes within Russian territory and to deploy anti-personnel mines introduces serious risks of escalating the Russia-Ukraine conflict while significantly undermining the prospects for peace. These actions have the potential to deepen hostilities, provoke severe retaliatory measures, and complicate diplomatic efforts toward a resolution. Allowing Ukraine to strike Russian territory with long-range missiles widens the battlefield, and may be perceived by Moscow as a direct threat to its sovereignty. This could provoke Russia into adopting more aggressive military strategies, including intensified airstrikes, increased troop mobilization, or unconventional tactics that further escalate the conflict. Such measures could also lead to greater destruction and civilian casualties, making it more difficult to contain the conflict geographically or politically. Moreover, 
the use of U.S.-supplied weapons to attack targets inside Russia risks escalating tensions between Moscow and NATO. Russia may interpret these actions as evidence of direct Western involvement, raising the likelihood of miscalculation or even confrontation with NATO member states. This scenario could have broader implications for European security with the potential for destabilizing repercussions beyond the immediate conflict zone. The introduction of anti-personnel mines into the conflict adds another layer of complexity. These weapons are widely condemned due to their indiscriminate nature and long-term humanitarian consequences. Although not banned by Ukraine or the United States, their deployment could lead to widespread harm to civilians further entrenching animosity and prolonging the conflict. The humanitarian impact of mines also risks alienating international support for Ukraine as nations already skeptical of escalating measures might view such tactics as exacerbating the suffering of non-combatants. These actions also have profound implications for diplomatic efforts. The use of long-range missiles and mines signals a shift toward intensifying military confrontation rather than seeking pathways to de-escalation. Russia is likely to interpret Ukraine's enhanced offensive capabilities as a sign that Western nations are committed to a military victory, making it less likely for Moscow to engage in peace talks. This hardening of positions on both sides undermines the possibility of a negotiated settlement, further entrenching the conflict. That's all for this video. Thank you for watching this video. We sincerely appreciate you joining us today. If our content resonated with you or sparked inspiration, please consider expressing your support by liking it and subscribing to stay connected with our community. Your support holds immense value for us. You can watch another video of our channel, which is now on the screen.